Welcome to CIAC's Glory Days podcast. This podcast gives an in-depth look into the inner workings of the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Conference and the purpose behind high school sports. Through interviews with coaches, players, administrators, and other guests, the CIAC immerses you into the glory days of high school sports. So now it's time to enjoy the next episode of the Glory Days podcast. Hello and welcome to the CIAC Glory Days podcast. I'm your host, Jada Maribel, and today we are joined with Greg Simon, the CIAC Associate Executive Director, Dave Schultz, the FCAC Commissioner and CIAC Boys Basketball Tournament Director, and Dan Scavone, Assistant Director of the CIAC. On this episode, Greg, Dave, Dan, and I will discuss how the Boys Basketball Committee determines divisional placements for teams and several key rule changes that will be implemented in this upcoming season. So Greg and Dave, we are about a week and a half away from the start of practice for boys basketball in Connecticut. Recently, the committee released the approved divisions for boys and girls basketball. Every year, there seems to be a discussion about the placement of one or two teams within the divisions. So, Greg, what is the process used to determine boys basketball divisions? Well, the process we use is a, a formula that's mm -hmm. uh, created to make sure that we're placing teams properly in divisions. Um, we have 181 uh, basketball playing schools on the boys' side, and I think it's interesting that Reporters seem to always pick out the mm -hmm. two or three they think are odd. We have a great batting average if that's the case. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we do okay. So we, we take a look at, at a three-year look back um, to add up and create a point total for each school in the state of Connecticut. And then those point totals are assigned to approved divisions. You know, the, the committee creates the size of each division blindly. Mm -hmm. And then when, when the schools are placed in those divisions, you know, uh, by the number of teams that should be in each division. So basically the formula is based upon uh, different elements. So really in all of our sports, enrollment is the most mm -hmm. important element. We take 66%, two-thirds of the size of the school, and we take that as our first set of points. After that, we take the amount of power points they've accrued over a three-year time period, mm -hmm. and we multiply that power points by the league, um, the league multiplier, which is either a three, a two, or a one, depending on what league you play in. The thinking behind that is that, that a, a league like the CCC or the FCAC or, or uh, the SEC, see, the, those leagues' wins are a little bit more value than they are many of our small school mm -hmm. leagues. So we want to make sure that the value of those wins uh, is, this, is the way we want to be able to seed it. So after that's done, we add in the um, success in tournament for those schools that are schools of choice. And um, once we do that, we take that entire total, we rank the schools 100 through 181, and then we put those teams into the pre-designed divisions. So before this formula was implemented, how did it work with boys basketball? Well, I can kind of chime in on that. I started coaching in 1978, so I've been around a while doing <laughs> uh, boys basketball. And uh, back in the, the pre-days and, and up until the mid-2000 uh, teens, it was based on size, and it was just size. So some of your schools of choice in the smaller divisions, because of their size of their school, were just dominating those divisions. And mm -hmm. the smaller non-schools of choice were a little frustrated with, with never being able to advance in the tournament. So that kind of was the impetus of getting us into a, a formula which would try to balance and put schools based on how they are, where they belong. Mm -hmm. So it seems that every year now that there's a question about the placement of maybe one or two teams. So can you tell us about the option to move up to Division One and what happens when teams opt to do that? Yes, any team can opt to move up to Division One from any division, but mm -hmm. they can only opt to move to Division One. Once the number of teams that have opted to go up to Division One. Greg talked about the preset number of 16 teams in Division I. Once they opt up, we want to keep that number at 16. So if three teams opt to go up, then we go from the 16th back towards the first of a non-school of choice, offering them the opportunity to move back down to Division II uh, to keep that number at 16. Mm -hmm. And now uh, this year, it seems that there's more than 16 teams that have opted to play Division I. So how is the committee going to handle 17 teams being in Division I? And what does it say about the design of the divisions that more teams want to be in Division One? Well, it's nice to see that some teams, you know, look to, to try to go up and be the most competitive division mm -hmm. they can be in. Uh, this year, we did have three teams choose to go up. And then as we went through, starting with 16, moving towards one of non-school of choice uh, teams, only two opted to go down. So we ended up with 17. Mm -hmm. So it would offer an opportunity to have a play-in game like you would if you had... 32 teams in a in a uh, Division II tournament and 33 or 33 teams 
you'd have to have a play-in game of 33, play 32 to get it to a 32-team division. So it kind of opts the same way of now we're going to have 17 versus mm -hmm. 16 to get to a 16-team division. So, Greg, the argument often comes from schools of choice that the formula is unfair. So what are the arguments that you have heard from some schools, and how can a school or the committee address those concerns? I think the committee is very open to taking a look at the formula and seeing what's working and what's not working. Mm -hmm. You know, we've um, we've we've tried to to see it both ways. You know, we understand uh, for for all of those years there was so much contention that small schools, especially in the S and M division, didn't have opportunities to win state tournaments. That schools of choice who naturally are able to draw from from student athletes outside of their district had an unfair advantage. Mm -hmm. Thus, you know, we understand there are some concerns, especially among our, you know, our agra schools who are are, are put into that uh, group of schools among charter magnet schools that they don't belong there and among our technical schools they don't belong there. But again, it's very hard to differentiate when mm -hmm. you're a school of choice. You know, if you have the ability to draw kids from outside, you know, that one kid or two kids that you draw, maybe you're starting center or maybe you're starting goalie in, 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 in other sports. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to, like, get in between the weeds and say, yes. you know, oh, this one's a school of choice, but this one's not a school of choice. So it's, it's very difficult. And obviously you always hear, you know, put the Catholic schools in all their, mm -hmm. in their own division. And again, we kind of laugh up here because, mm -hmm. you know, there's, I, I believe there's 12 boys Catholic schools left that have boys, 12. Some of them are tiny schools like Immaculate and mm -hmm. St. Bernard's, and some of them are huge schools like Xavier and Fairfield Prep. It, it would make no sense to play them in their own division. And how do you play them in your own, their own division when you're not, you're not playing other schools of choice in their own divisions? Mm -hmm. So we, we get the contention out there. We get the, the, the argument both ways. But we really believe that when the formula is used, it's a very fair way to address the concerns of, our, of, of many of our member schools. Mm -hmm. So besides that suggestion of putting the Catholic schools all in their own league, has there been any other proposed changes to this formula from schools? Uh, well, again, we made a promise uh, when we were going out talking to the different leagues about the formula way back in 2017, when we were talking to them, we said that after three years, we would take a good, hard evaluation of the formula, see what was working, what wasn't working. You know, and we had great success the first two years of the formula, wonderful tournaments at Mohegan Sun, really saw a lot of teams making the finals that hadn't made it before, and was it was great. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, COVID came along, mm -hmm. and for two consecutive years, we didn't have a tournament. Thus, we didn't have any tournament data to add to the formula, and we were kind of stuck. So we were using a lot of older information. So, but after the third year of the tournament, we did meet, and we sat down, and we talked about what changes we could make. And at that point, uh, a subcommittee made some recommendations to the full committee, but the full committee said they really didn't want to, to do any of those changes at this point because they wanted three solid years of data to be able to make changes. So we'll have a great tournament this year, and then the subcommittee will meet again over the summer, and we'll make some recommendations back on, on things like the league multipliers. Very hard to get right. You know, mm -hmm. leagues change and things happen. And, and when you have schools that aren't very successful in basketball and they have that large league multiplier, you know, moves them up divisions, we have a lot of thinking to do. But it's not like we don't want to try to make it the best it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. I just, it's really important that people out there looking at it understand the intent of the formula was never to create a super division. It was never meant for that. Nobody ever talked about that up here. The idea was to push schools of choice into the larger divisions, thus giving the, the non-schools of choice a better opportunity to, to play longer in the tournament and to play for championships. Mm -hmm. So now that we have the division set and practices will begin next week, tip off the regular season is just around the corner. So Dan, when games tip off this year, we'll have a shot clock for the first time in Connecticut. And we also have a change in the rules where players will shoot two foul shots rather than one, and one after 17 fouls. And the addition of a new rule that a player must leave the floor for one tick of the clock after receiving a technical foul. So in a previous podcast episode, we spoke about the shot clock. Can you tell us how officials, what officials are doing with our schools to prepare for this new rule implementation? Sure. Um, we've collaborated with Timing is Everything, which is a private business. And this business has been out there working shot clocks, uh, and game clocks uh, in college level basketball in Connecticut since 1996. So they've been around a while. Um, the owners of this company, as well as the commissioner of the company, felt it was their obligation to help us with this, this, this project. And they volunteered their staff 
to put on clinics for our member schools and our leagues. And, you know, in conjunction with the commissioners of the leagues, we set up dates and times and we provided opportunities for future shot clock operators of our member high schools to attend these. And they've been very informative. Uh, they've been hands-on. Um, they actually uh, put together a simulation of game situations. So our, our, our kids were able to play a half and uh, that potential operators are able to identify mistakes and, and identify um, what needed to transpire rather than what occurred. So they actually purposely made mistakes mm -hmm. to help the learning pr curve. And I think it uh, was very effective. And we tried to have these clinics at different parts of the state. So it would be ample opportunities for everyone to attend. So we, we sort of did it by league. Um, so we started with the eastern part of the state and we moved all the way to Litchfield, uh, last Wednesday was our last clinic. So we ran five of them, and uh, we have one today. There's one mm -hmm. at uh, Weston High School at 245, and uh, that's going to be, I'm sure, uh, uh, well attended, and uh, we'll be ready from that standpoint. We also sent out two documents. Our state rule interpreter, along with the local in, uh, basketball interpreters, put together a, a lengthy document about the shot clock uh, guidelines. And... Um, that's been sent out numerous times. And we took that version and actually condensed it and made a table chart that we're, we've asked schools to actually laminate and put on their scores tables. It's short of a, a cheat sheet. Cheat sheet. Mm -hmm. So when uh, games occur, that shot clock operator can review that before the game. You know, they should be, just like officials, they should need to have a, a pregame. And officials will have a pregame with that shot clock operator to talk about the dy dynamics of the uh, of, of the protocol. Um, so that would be readily available. And then lastly, the National Federation of High Schools put out a, a very, very uh, guided version of, of, of a video. Um, that's been sent out to our member schools as well. So they've had ample learning resources. Um, so I expect it to, uh, to go off pretty well. Mm -hmm. Wow, those are all great things we're doing to help get everyone adjusted to this. Yes. So <laughs> Dave, how has the FCAC been preparing for the implementation of the shot clock? Uh, I think we might have been the first league to host a shot clock clinic back in October at Norwalk High School. Mm -hmm. And um, we had over 50 people there. So we invited every school to send either their shot clock operator, their regular clock operator, uh, an official who might want to also do a shot clock on the side and, and to try to teach that. I think the, the, the main thing is going to be that little shot clock cheat sheet that mm -hmm. can be laminated and put right there that someone mm -hmm. can read. Because inevitably, you might have a sickness and someone might have to say, hey, can you fill mm -hmm. in today? So we need to be able to prepare them and, and keep them going. All, I know uh, that all our schools in the FCAC, thankfully, have their shot clocks mounted and ready to go. So that's a positive that we're in line, ready to go. Oh, well, that's great. So, Greg, what was the interest in implementing the one tick of the clock sit out rule following a technical foul? Sure. We've, um, you know, we've seen that sometimes tempers flare during mm -hmm. our games and we had some, some high profile uh, altercations last year during games. And we started to talk a little bit about with the Connecticut High School Coach Association what we might be able to do. So the Connecticut High School Coach Association came up with a proposal kind of based on what a yellow card does in soccer. Mm -hmm. You know, it removes the student athlete from the field in soccer for one tick of the clock and they can re-enter the game once they've settled down. And you're not going to have that, that quick whip around where if a kid gets a technical foul the next time down the court, and if he's not taken off the court, he immediately wants to retaliate or she wants to retaliate against the player, mm -hmm. you know, uh, from the other team. So I think it's that ability to be able to cool down, settle down for a little bit and not to to have those quick double technicals that happen quite often or lead to fights on the court. So mm -hmm. we're just again, I think all of our committees are in a constant look to see how we can implement sportsmanship among our student athletes and try to make the game the best we can mm -hmm. for, for all of them. And we appreciate the Connecticut High School Coach Association taking the lead in that and creating that. Certainly Joe Canzanella, the late Joe Canzanella, had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. So, Dan, do you agree with Greg that this will help officials in managing the game or at least help players to calm down so that they hopefully avoid getting a quick second technical? I do, very much so. I think, uh, and, you know, officials themselves are going to treat this as an opportunity to um, converse with the coach as well. I think when, when the player is removed from the game, um, the coach will have a better understanding of what transpired. And I, I would imagine some coaches will keep their players out for longer than a one ticket o'clock. 
Um, and, and that will vary from situation to situation, but certainly um, in many cases, the player's emotions um, would not warrant them to stay in the game. So I think this is a, a, a positive move by our committees to implement this. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the rule change to eliminate one-on-one -on -one foul shots? Is that a Connecticut rule or an NFHS rule change? That is a federation rule change. So that is, um, and we are a federation state. And mm -hmm. um, so basically it, it, it kind of follows the, the premise of the women's college game now. So on the fifth common foul, so your fifth team foul, uh, your opponent will shoot uh, two shots. So it basically eliminates the one and one. Um, interestingly, the fouls will reset every quarter. So after the first quarter, it will be reset to zero. At start of the third quarter, it will be reset mm -hmm. to zero. And the start of the fourth quarter, reset to zero. So the theory here is that there was two objectives. Number one, based on a lot of the research the Federation has done with some physicality and injuries on the one and one sequence, um, they're hoping this will minimize and, and eliminate the, the, the risk of injury there. That's, that was one philosophy. The other rationale was with resetting the fouls to, um, to increase the flow of the game. So you're not in a long period of time where you have uh, more than seven fouls in, in, mm -hmm. in the previous rule, and you'd be shooting foul shots for a s significant period of time, and it really, really dis disrupted the, the, the flow of the game. So I think the reset of the fouls and then going to the two shots, um, I think that's going to accomplish both, uh, uh, you know, both of those rationales. It's it's definitely going to lend credence to it, and I think uh, I think you're going to see a game. It's going to be interesting to see how that works out. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be unless you watch a lot of women's college basketball. I think folks around here um, certainly aren't, aren't 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 used to that that nuance of the game. So it'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I look forward to seeing it this season with all these new rules implemented, seeing how the game changes. Yeah, absolutely. So now every episode we wrap up with the question of what is the purpose of high school sports? So, Dan, we'll start with you. What do you believe the purpose is behind high school sports? Well, we always talk about being education-based, and I, I, I certainly think the onus, you know, obviously at the winning, at, at the varsity level, winning does play a role, but I think with high school sports, there should be more to it. So in addition to teaching kids how to win graciously and how to lose graciously, um, I think part of it is to help, help young people understand that they're part of a team. And that team component is so important when, in, in everyday life. You know, they're going to be, when they're in their professions, they're going to have to work with other people. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have to have ups and downs. And that's what sports is about, ups and downs. And they're going to have to take those practices that they've implemented through their athletic careers and bring them to everyday life. So I think it's 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 more than just um, how many championships they've won. You know, you, you really have to look at um, did I even make it through the season? I'm, I'm a high school athlete. I'm not sure if I wanted to participate in this sport, but I did. I put the time in. I put the work effort in, and I completed a one of my goals in life. And I think that's the way you have to look at high school sports. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's more than just the the athleticism itself. Oh, I can obviously echo everything that, that mm -hmm. Dan said. He kind of touched base on everything. But one of the things from my coaching days I felt was really beneficial from, for a student athlete to take from the end of a season would be the fact how hard they wanted to work to improve, to maximize their ability level. Not everybody has the same ability level. So if they want to, and which carries right over into life, maximize what you do on the job, how, how you can do things, and how that benefits the team together. So I think that's really what we hope for. Greg? Again, with education-based athletics, I mean, athletics become, and I think people forget all the time that we're not professional, the kids are not professional athletes, college athletes. You know, it's an extension of the classroom. You're, you know, you the same kind of things you're trying to learn in the classroom can be taught so well, you know, on the athletic field. And I think the relationships you develop, you know, with your teammates, obviously, but also with your coaches mm -hmm. and, and having that lifelong relationship, you know, coming off that uh, championship weekend that we had yesterday uh, the, and the day before, seeing the, the hugs among coaches and players and the years of knowing a lot of these people and being a great influence in their life mm -hmm. is just really, really important. And 
again, it's 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 not the as Danny said, it's not the wins and losses all the time. I always said it's the bus rides, it's the pasta parties, mm -hmm. it's the laughing after practice when things are all done, the things you remember the most. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what education based athletics is all about. Yes, those are all such great and meaningful answers. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will see you next time on the Glory Days podcast.